Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the A4 webinar. It's a kind of our tenth webinar since the last uh, last year due to the COVID nineteen pandemic. It seems we are still not able to see her meet face by face, but uh, uh, but thanks, uh, Dr. Allen, uh, the whole A4 community. So we are set up this. Uh, the mass webinar to share the ideas and the latest development in the medical physics. So today uh, it's our honor to welcome uh, the Iwa uh, Debra to give us a talk. And our moderator today is uh, uh, Hajimi Monza. Dr. Hajimi is the associate professor from the Kinga University Graduate School of Medical Science. Uh, he's also the chair of our funding committee, the OIBON. Dr. Hajibi uh, is graduated from the Suzuka University of Medical Science with a doctor of health science. So basically, Dr. Hajibi will take over the whole uh, webinar mm -hmm. and including the discussion portions. So uh, now I uh, would like to hand my uh, microphone to Dr. Hajibi to moderate the whole webinar. Dr. Hajibi. Okay, okay, thank you for your introduction, Professor Jin. So I will share my slide. Yeah. Can you see? Yeah. Yes, uh, to, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Monzen. I work at uh, uh, Kinda University in Japan. Today, our subject is to understand the targeted alpha and beta therapies. So before starting uh, this seminar, this is a brainstorming. Anti-cancer treatment, such as surgery, radiotherapy, and chemo, consider standard of care in oncology. And the new therapy are needed to increase the system, systematic cancer control to diminish normal tissue side effect. And uh, Eva is described in detail. Target therapy for cancer is a rapidly expanding and successful approach to the management of many cancer and it gaining clinical interest around the world. Yeah, today we have to run the uh, target therapy has been rapidly implemented for improved control of systematic cancer. So Next, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Eva Bizak. Yeah, she is a professor in medical radiation and the director for translation cancer research at the University of South Australia. Previously, she was the chief medical phys 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 physicist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. And she authored and co over 160 paper and supervised over 33 PhD students. Especially her group are national leader in radiobiology and modeling using Monte Carlo. Uh, they have started developing a new micro dosimetry measurement technique for detection alpha particles using a time fix detector, which is one of the most existing micro dosimeter on the market. Yeah, today I'm very happy to have this opportunity. All right, please start Prof. Eva, please. Thank you. Hajime, can you stop sharing, please? Okay. Thank you, wonderful. Uh, I will start sharing now. Can I please confirm that my screen can be seen? Okay. Yeah, 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 please. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much uh, to AFUNC for having me today and allowing me to present to you today. Uh, as uh, was already mentioned, I will be talking on the specific topic of targeted therapies in treatment of cancer. So these are some of the topics that I will uh, cover, including challenges in cancer management, a bit of the introduction to targeted radiotherapy, and I will compare advantages, disadvantages of targeted alpha versus targeted beta therapy. 
I will talk about the example of targeted therapies for the case of pancreatic cancer. And if I have time, I will show you some of our experimental results using TAMPIX, Tampix detector. Uh, as you are very aware, up to 50% of cancer patients these days should receive some form of radiotherapy for treatment of their cancer. This is primarily delivered with the use of medical linear ex, uh, accelerators. One of the key advantages of radiation oncology, it is that it is very effective and non-invasive anti-cancer treatment that corresponds to about 40% of cures and it doesn't have an associated mortality risk. However, we also see that the particle therapy is on the rise and you can immediately see the benefits of using uh, particles such as protons in this case, in sparing healthy tissues and reducing normal tissue complications uh, in case of patients. However, the best external beam, hadron or particle therapy may not save the life of a cancer patient. This is because accelerator-based therapies are highly localized therapies. There are very few therapies that can stop the development of advanced metastatic cancer for micrometastases after the local treatment of the primary tumor. And therefore, systemic approaches to cancer therapies are needed. If you look at the development on cancer therapies over the years, what we can see that we have progressed from 2D imaging, 2D therapy uh, to 3D imaging, 3D therapy, IMRT, high LAT particles, and many of them are increasing the cost of treatment for smaller increases in the benefits. So also from the point of cost effectiveness, are we asking, are there therapies such as the targeted therapies that I will be talking about that can, for a minimum increase of co in cost, significantly increase the benefit in cancer treatment. Whenever you are talking about controlling of cancer, we really need to talk about two aspects, the localized side-dependent outcome where the primary cancer or tumor is. And we also have to talk in the later stages about controlling the metastasis. In case of localized diseases, we have achieved really, really well, and we have some rooms for improvement, either to using new pet cancers or minimizing organ movement or using the tracking of organ motion. However, in terms of metastasis and micrometastasis, we still need solutions. We need new assays for micrometastasis, we need technology for their detection, and we needed targeted therapies. And really, only at the time when you can manage both the local disease and the distant metastatic disease, we have won the war on cancer. Control of micrometastasis means improved prognosis. Uh, so how can we deal with systemic problems? Uh, obviously the most common therapy for systemic uh, treatment is chemotherapy, but chemotherapy, as you are aware, is linked to very detrimental side effects uh, for cancer patients. Immunotherapy, for cancer is a very successful approach to the systemic management of many intraceptual metastatic cancer. However, current therapies tend to fail in the longer term, and there continues to be a need for improved targeted cancer cell toxicities, and immunotherapies are still being developed. So when we are looking at the need for these new targeted cancer cell therapies, perhaps this can be achieved if we can have a good targeting vector that can be radio labeled with an alpha or beta emitting radioisotope 
to develop something called radio immunotherapy. And lots of my data here will be uh, based on the literature review that we published a couple of years ago uh, with the late dear Barry Allen, and it's titled Global Comparison of Targeted Alpha versus Targeted Beta Therapy for Cancer. So the major principle of targeted radiotherapies is that you have a radioactive isotope that is being connected to a monoclonal antibody via a glue that we call a chelator. Once they are connected, you will achieve a radioimmunoconjugate. This radioimmunoconjugate then can be injected inside a patient's body. It can be injected either intravenously or in some cases, even inside the cavities, like for example, abdominal cavities for the treatment of ovarian cancer. And the radioimmunoconjugate is such that it can selectively attach itself to a specific receptor protein that is present only on a cancer cell and not present on normal cells. This way, you can really get the targeted effect when the radioimmunoconjugate is uptaken by the tumor or circulating cancer cells in the bloodstream or metastasis and micrometastasis elsewhere in the body. Where the, when the radioisotope decays, it will emit beta particles, or in these illustrations, alpha particles that can then traverse the cancer cells, cause DNA damage, and inactivate or kill the cancer cell. So the most important thing, apart from having a good radioimmunoconjugate, is also an identification of this cancer cell receptor that is specific for the cancer cell only, but it's not present on or normal tissues, so that this differential effect can be achieved. So when we look at the physical and radiobiological properties of alpha and beta radiation, the, in this table, we have properties in the first column in the second column, we have properties of the alpha particles and in the last of the beta particles. The range of alpha particles in tissue is 20 to 80 microns. So when an alpha particle is emitted, it can travel through three to four cells. However, the beta radiation can travel 300 to 100,000, uh, uh, 11,000 micrometers. So it can actually travel even outside the tumor towards the healthy tissues. The linear energy transfer, this is very important to, in order to determine the density of the ionization for alpha particle is 100 kilo electron volts per micrometers. For beta radiation, which is only a sparsely ionizing radiation, this is 0.3 kilo electron volts per micrometer. And therefore, radiobiological effectiveness as compared to the linear accelerator external beam for beta particle is identical, it's one, but is five times or even more effective when using alpha radiation. If you're looking at the internal damage, RB for alpha radiation within the DNA, can be larger than 100. Uh, pharmacokinetics, the half-lives uh, of the radioisotopes used uh, for alpha therapy vary from one hour to 10 days, in beta therapy, seven hours to seven days. Uh, this is really quite important because it actually takes 24 to 48 hours, depending on the radioimmunoconjugate and the patient to achieve the full uptake of the, and the mode of injection, full uptake into the uh, tumor. 
and therefore the very short half-lives are potentially not effective for targeted alpha and targeted beta therapies. The advantage of beta therapy is that usually it's only one step decay to reach a stable nuclide. However, with the alpha isotopes, in many of them, there could be multiple alpha decays uh, before the stable isotope is reached. This could be positive or a negative, as I explain later. So how can alpha and beta radiations be used? Can they treat isolated cancer cells? Alpha isotopes can, because a single traversal of an alpha particle through a cancer cell can cause enough DNA damage to inactivate the cell. However, multiple beta particles are required to cause sufficient damage to kill a cancer cell. Can they kill stem cells? Yes, again, because of the larger RBE that beta particles cannot do. Can they cause antivascular effects? The reason for the antivascular effects is that as the Tumors often have a very chaotic leaky vasculature. And when the radioimmunoconjugate is permeating through the vasculature, alpha particles can cause significant damage to the local tumor vasculature. And when they close the vessels off, the tumor will become deprived of oxygen and nutrients. And therefore you have additional damage that results in cell kill of the tumor. Once again, the lower RBE of the beta particles cannot achieve this effect. Similarly, alpha particles <coughs> can still kill small micro metastasis cluster, while the beta particles uh, can do as well. Tumor cell crossfire. This comes back to the range of alpha and beta particles. The alpha particles, as I mentioned before, they can only travel through two to four cells before they come to a complete stop. So the high LET and the short range of alpha particles means that they are preferred to kill isolated cells. Uh, if the alpha immunoconjugate diffuses into the nucleus, the toxicity increases markedly, which cannot be achieved with beta particles. Uh, beta particles, because their range is up to 11,000 micrometers, they are maybe very good when they are irradiating tumor as such. But if they are irradiating micrometastasis, this means that their range is much larger than the size of the micrometastasis and they will contribute to the radiation dose of healthy tissues. Very quick comparison of two quite commonly used radioisotopes. One is lutetium-177 with the half-life of 6.73 days. And the other one is bismuth-213 with the half-life of about 67 minutes. The other commonly used uh, beta emitting isotopes are iodine-131, rhenium-188, homium-166, or yttrium-90. With the alpha-emitting isotopes, astatine-211 is being used, radium-223, actinium-225 is really increasing in prominence. So once again, if I compare lutetium with bismuth, uh, lutetium produces beta particles with the energy of about 150 keV. Alpha particles produced by bismuth have 8 MeV energy. Effective range of the lutetium is about 300 microns, so maybe 10 to 15 cell diameters. Uh, for bismuth, this is 80 microns, uh, so 3 to 4 cell diameters. And you can see that there is a 200 times larger uh, LET energy loss in kilo electron volts per micrometers for bismuth as compared to lutetium. 
the disadvantage of bismuth is a very short half-life. That means that it will decay significantly in the patient's body before the top uptake is reached in the uh, tumor or cancers. And therefore the world is very much looking these days towards actinium-225. So uh, evidence and Monte Carlo simulations shows that actinium-225 gives up to nearly five times the specific energy per decade compared to bismuth-213. And this results in 100 times decreased in vitro cancer cell survival compared to bismuth 213. So actinium is 100 times more effective in killing cancer cell. The longer half-life also allows deeper infusion, diffusion into the pericapillary volume. Uh, as I mentioned, this could take up to one to two days for solid tumors. Uh, Actinium-225 decays by four alpha emissions. So the number of unblocked antigens required is one quarter of that for bismuth-213. This means that either cells with one four of the antigenic expression, you remember that receptor on the cancer cells, or conjugate with one fourth the specific activity will still be effective, meaning you need much lesser doses. Uh, it has a half-life. You can say that this half-life is potentially on the higher side of 10 days. And this can result in the instability of the radioamino conjugate. And potentially, this association of either acti uh, actinium-2 to 5 or the daughter nuclei, this is the decay schema of actinium-225 until the stable isotope uh, is reached uh, from the radioimmunoconjugate. And then you, if that happens, you no longer have a targeted radioactive product because actinium or any of the daughter products will be moving freely within the patients and could contribute to significant untargeted alpha background, reducing thus the maximum tolerated dose to patient. So it is very important, one way to avoid some of these problems is to create radioimmunoconjugates with the receptors that do not stay on the outside of the cell but uh, get absorbed, get internalized by the cell. And when the actinium decays, all of these daughter products, whether francium, radium, astatine, bismuth or so, would be still internalized within the cell and contributing towards the damage. So this is some area of research that's, that's ongoing. This is an example of Monte Carlo calculations of specific energy spectrum in the targeted cell nucleus for each of the radioisotopes. This is the specific energy uh, delivered uh, to the targeted nucleus. And we have a comparison from radium 2 to 3, actinium 2 to 5, to lutetium 177. So as you can see, and these are to fit them on the scales, these have been uh, multiplied for the purposes. So what you can see, specific energy of actinium-2 to 5 is 850 times higher than the specific energy of lutetium-177. Uh, in vitro experiments using different radioisotopes uh, using melanoma research, show that the cell survival for melanoma cells incubated with different activities with bismuth 213 as compared to terbium 152, which is a beta labeled uh, radioimmune conjugate, show minimum effectiveness of beta targeted radiotherapy 
as compared to bismuth 213 radiotherapy. So again, the comparative RB from these experiments showed RB of the targeted alpha radiation to targeted beta radiations of about 120. Uh, all is well in preclinical cell lines work, but the translation of this wonderful physical and radiobiological data to preclinical and clinical trials is actually really quite complex and safety, patient safety and toxicities really need to be investigated. There are many other factors involved apart from radiation biology, uh, tumor vasculature and permeability. Can the radioisotope actually penetrate from the, from the vessels inside the tumor? Uh, tumor hypoxia, bioavailability, heterogeneity of tumor uptake. Tumors are made of many tumor and cancer cells, and not all of them have to express that particular protein that will bind your radioimmunoconjugate. What if the receptor expression is very low, only 10 to 20%, then you do not have a good targeted therapy. Uh, also, you need to understand what specific activities would be used. And when you are preparing radio in your immunoconjugate, not all of the antibody will be conjugated to the radioisotope. So you will have unlabeled conjugate. And this unlabeled conjugate, unlabeled antibody, will still be able to attach itself to the cancer cells. And once the cancer receptor is blocked, you cannot get the later active antibody to connect to the cancer cell. We also need to know what are the clearance rate of the radioimmunoconjugates through the body and how does it compare to the isotope's half-life. So intensive testing needs to be done both for alpha and betas using the same targeting vector. If you are using the same targeting vector, it doesn't mean that when conjugated with an alpha isotope, it will have the same behavior as when conjugated with beta isotope. Let's have a look at some uh, in vivo studies. Uh, we are looking at the therapeutic efficacy of actinium 225, uh, bismuth 213 uh, versus yttrium 90 beta isotope uh, for breast used for the treatment in breast cancer in transgenic mice. So what you can see, these are the controls. Of course, the controls uh, can uh, will not survive. We have a survival fractions and here we have the times in days for the survival. If we look at the yttrium 90, these are these empty squares. It really maybe slightly improves the survival, but the end point is just about the same. Bismuth 213 increases the survival from 50 days to about 80 days, the total uh, absolute maximum survival. So it improves the overall survival. But because of the short half-life of bismuth, you don't achieve full effectiveness of the targeted alpha therapy. However, when you are looking when uh, actinium is applied, these are the triangles here, really even 200 days after the administration, you are still achieving tumor control in about 70% of animals. So this is quite, quite exciting. So have a look at the, what cancers have been treated with the radioimmunoconjugate, what vectors have been used, and what are the findings. So uh, researchers have treated colon cancer with bismuth 213 and yttrium 90. 
this is the vector. I'm not going to read the names. You can read it yourself. Uh, significant beta kidney toxicities have been identified. So preference was confirmed for alpha particles. Neuroendocrine tumors have been treated with actinium-225 and lutetium-177. Alpha has been identified to have superior therapeutic window. So again, the preferential uh, superior outcomes and preferences for alpha therapy. Multiple myeloma has been trialed in bismuth-213 and lutetium-77 studies. Uh, alpha medium survival was two times longer compared to beta particles. So again, alpha performed superiorly. Breast lung metastases have been trialed with actinium-2 to 5 versus yttrium-90. Alpha survival was more than one year longer compared to beta therapy. In prostate cancer, uh, beta-213 was compared versus lutetium-177. Uh, overall survival at maximum tolerated dose was two times longer as compared to larger as compared to beta. Peritoneal carcinomatosis, such as ovarian cancer growing, uh, growing in the peritoneal cavity, uh, bismuth-213 was compared with lutetium-177. There were adverse events observed for beta particles and none with alpha particles for the same efficacy. So we have emerging clinical evidence for superior performance of alpha particle therapy. This is one of the very important pictures that was presented in 2018 at the uh, American Nuclear Medicine uh, Society Conference in the United States by Michael Hoffman, who is a nuclear medicine physician, one of the top nuclear medicine physicians in Australia. And they have shown their results using gallium-68 PSMA targeted therapy imaging before and after lutetium-177 PSMA ligand for a castrate-resistant metastatic prostate carcinoma. And they are really, really quite amazing because what you will find that in many of these patients, lutetium-177 was able to regress the metastatic cancer in the patient. So there is immediate effect when using the targeted beta therapy for treatment of these cancer patients. However, according to the statement by Michael Hoffman himself, Despite these incredible images, nearly all these patients progressed over time and the survival of men is poor. So we need to do better and alpha may be part of the solution. Uh, we have similar clinical data reported from um, Germany by Kratochwil et al. This data has been published in 2016 and has been you know, widely distributed around the world, where once again, they are using gallium-68 PSMA PET-CT scan after beta and then alpha therapy. Image A shows the initial tumor spread. As you can see, the whole abdominal cavity has been involved. Uh, you can see the picture B, which is the imaging after the two cycles of lutetium-177 PSMA. What you can see that the tumor actually has not regressed. The tumor, the disease has progressed. Also, the problem is with the PSMA 
that PSMA is also excreted by normal salivary glands. So when you are using the PSMA targeting vector, you are not targeting cancer only, but you would be targeting the salivary glands of the cancer patient as well, which is the negative side effect. And then the patient has been treated with the two times and an additional course of actinium 2 to 5 PSMA. And what you can see that the uh, disease regression or even in some of the patients, complete remission has been received. As they are mentioning, patients were selected with the worst prognosis, that is with the bone marrow and visceral and bone metastasis. Several patients achieved complete remission, some of whom had PSA values larger than 3000 nanograms per millimeter. But what you can see that because the PSMA vector was used, the major negative side effects was uh, the activation of salivary glands and major xerostomia in salivary glands. So alpha therapy is very promising, but maybe should not be targeting PSMA, but a vector that, or a receptor that is much more specific to a particular cancer. So let's have a look at other evidence, comparative clinical efficacy of targeted alpha versus targeted beta therapies. Once again, we have uh, cancers leukemias, where the, these were the uh, targeted beta therapies have been progressed to phase two and phase three clinical trials. Targeted alpha therapies, hasn't quite got to that stage. We have lots of pilot studies, phase one and phase two studies, and phase three studies have been reported only for radium two to three. So for leukemias, here we have the radioisotopes, here we have the uh, vectors that have been used. Um, Incomplete response, 70% uh, survival has been achieved at 12 months. Targeted therapies have been found safe and 25% uh, of patients have complete responses with no to uh, toxicities. Preference was for alpha. In melanomas, metastasis and phase one trials, 50% uh, uh, reduction uh, uh, and stable metastases were found at three months. Overall survival was achieved uh, of 13 months with no toxicities. Uh, maximum tolerated doses have not been really achieved. The jury is still out whether alpha or beta particles are better. For bone metastases, this is the phase three trials. Uh, the bone targeting pain relief and increased pain relief and survivals have been achieved and it proves superiority of alpha particles. Uh, for ovarian carcinoma, again using LET212, uh, astatine 21 and yttrium 90 overall survival unfortunately was unchanged because often the whole intraperitoneal cavity is already invaded. Uh, there was no significant toxicity found. There is potential for uh, increased therapeutic ratio as compared to beta particles. So there is preference for alpha particles. Glioblastoma, uh, indium, yttrium, astatin, bismuth have been trialed. Uh, overall survival has been increased. Uh, it has been found to, to be safe, uh, preference with alpha particles. Neuroendocrine tumors, again, studies are available for yttrium, lutetium, bismuth 213. 24% response has been identified. 
progression-free survival has been found at 64% at 20 months. Uh, beta particles uh, had high efficacy, but the preference is still for alpha particles. Castrate-resistant prostate cancer, overall efficacy of 20, to, uh, survival of 22 months. Uh, there have been some complete remissions, but if you are using PSMA ligand, beware that there will be salivary gland normal tissue toxicities or xerostomia. Again, a superiority of alpha particles has been proven. So in conclusion one, the radiobiological properties of radioimmunotherapy, both the preclinical and the clinical trials all demonstrate the advantage of alpha emitting isotopes for hypoxic environment to target isolated cancer cells and residual disease with also an added effect of antivascular targeted therapies. The preclinical and clinical evidence at the moment shows that TET is superior to targeted beta therapy in terms of efficacy within the safe tolerant doses. I will also concentrate on pa pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, reason being that this is a still very difficult to treat cancer with the five-year survival rate in Australia of only about 10%. And the only minor improvements have been achieved over the last 50 years uh, in treatment of this disease. Conventional treatments include surgery, uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but none of them have been very effective. One of the reasons for this, that the pancreatic cancer is extremely hard to diagnose and treat. It is diagnosed usually very late when the disease has already progressed. It has a very com complicated uh, location within the anatomical structure of the abdomen and has complicated vasculature, which complicates the surgery, making it very, very difficult. It has a very high cellular heterogeneity. So immunotherapy may not be active if your particular receptor is not highly prevalent. Uh, it has a stromal barrier. So the, just like the brain, so chemotherapy cannot really penetrate through the vasculature inside the heart, the head of the pancreas. This is where the disease is primarily located. And because uh, it has this stromal barrier, the tumor is often uh, has high degree of oxygen deficiency, therefore is hypoxic. And therefore, your external beam radiotherapy will not be very effective. So we need to really look at better therapies for pancreatic cancer. Uh, Beta-targeted therapies have been trialed for pancreatic cancers. These are some of the com commonly used targets, including EGFR, integrins, MUC1, carcinoembryonic antigen, and so on. Radioisotopes that have been trialed have been iodine-131, yttrium-90, and lutetium-177. Uh, what has been clinically identified that all of these isotopes assisted to suppress tumor growth, uh, but the, the improvements were lower in survival versus targeted alpha therapy. The common side effects included weight loss, decreased activity, diarrhea, and cytopenia. Uh, these are some of the phase one, phase two clinical trials of beta therapies. Uh, ideally, they should be still used in combination with other therapies such as chemotherapy, Gemcitabine is the commonly used drug. 
uh, what you can see that the disease control has been primarily achieved uh, within the three months. Uh, and they use either single radioimmunotherapy or multiple fraction radioimmunotherapy with or without hemoradiotherapy. These are the side effects. Uh, as I mentioned before, they included cytopenia, fatigue, anemia, nausea, abdominal pain. But as you can see, at least one of these trials had to be terminated due to insufficient improvement in survival. That means the side effects were still uh, not worth to guarantee limited benefits to the patient. In targeted alpha therapy, uh, we are using similar vectors have been used, including HER2, MUC1. The radioisotopes that have been used were 213 bismuth, 212 lead, 225 actinium. Outcomes have been better because they included inhibition of tumor growth, improved survival versus untreated controls. Side effects were primarily uh, limited to transient weight loss. You can see that the side effects can be limited because of that short range of alpha particles that are not affecting, uh, not involving the larger volume of healthy tissues. So we can see that targeted alpha therapy can actually work against the anatomical barriers that I was mentioning before. The pancreatic vasculature can be mitigated if you are maybe using direct injections to the pancreas or peritoneal cavities, but you can also use IV injections. Cellular heterogeneity can be mitigated by crossfire or bystander effects, because if this alpha radioamino conjugate is attached to one cancer cells, it can also alpha particle affect the neighboring cancer cells that has not been radio labeled. Because the alpha particles have high RBE, it can also be effective in terms of the hypoxic pancreatic cancer environment. Uh, the stromal barrier and high interstitial pressure can be managed if you are using direct pancreat pancreas injections or intraperineal injections. However, as we know, the um, TET in pancreas is still primarily in pilot studies and phase one, phase two studies. So gaps exist in targeted alpha therapy clinical trials alone or in combination, and we need still more work to be done. So we need to produce international trials that will bring the uh, particle targeted therapies to phase three trials. We need to better understand effectiveness and toxicities to be defined. We need to look at new targeting therapeutic uh, vectors. And we also need to investigate more combination therapy, particle therapy with chemotherapy, and also hypoxic activators. Maybe we can also use drugs that would relieve hypoxia in pancreatic cancer. I am nearly out of time, so I will not be talking about the, our experimental study, but I will finish with this one slide. While this may not be case in Australia, it appears that targeted alpha therapy with actinium-225 is exploding around the world. And there is a worldwide shortage in actinium-225 supplies. I have been recently in touch with a number of suppliers and I only mentioned few here. One of the major one is the Institute for Transuranium Elements in Karlsruhe, Germany. You cannot purchase actinium-225 from them this year. Uh, they will not give you any isotope for research purposes because all their production is already clinically committed.
so fully clinically used. Russia, they have a, co a company Isotope JSC. Their regular volumes have been all sold out and maybe there will be some availability in the latter half of this year. USA, the Oak Ridge National Isotope Development Center, actinium 225 that's produced via decay of uranium uh, isotopes is all sold out for this year, but they also produce actinium 225 and actinium 227 in accelerator irradiation, which is more ex uh, expensive. So that may be available in April. So to me, this is telling that really actinium 225 is currently the hot isotope that everyone in the area of targeted therapies is looking towards to. So because my time is out, I will finish here and I am happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you for a great presentation, Eva. Uh, I think this is the more than perfect seminar. Uh, fortunately, we received uh, uh, some question from participants. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see the chat in chat chat box? Okay, let me let me have. Yeah, a look. first one is uh, lutetium has uh, one hundred fifty kb energy. Is there any complication to burn due to a photoelectric absorption during the target radiation therapy of other organ? Uh, yes, of course, at that 100 and, uh, sorry, 150 kV, we're talking about electrons. Mm -hmm. Photoelectric effect is related to photons. Mm -hmm. So okay. the low energy electrons that does not have any increased impact on the bones. Okay. And the second one is that the amount of activity at simulation depends on the weight of patients. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And yeah. this is this is another unknown. So mm -hmm. the the prescription it can is being done differently, and this is where the phase zero and phase one trials are being done to determine mm -hmm. the maximum tolerance dose. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the um, prescribed activities are done based on weight on the patients. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are done based on the BMI or the patient or the mm -hmm. square area of the patient. Mm -hmm. Some other theories say that it should be prescribed to the fat-free mass of the patient because okay. fat will not absorb the radioimmunoconjugate. Mm -hmm. So if you basically take the whole mass of the patient and you then prescribe large dose because of the larger mass of the patient, mm -hmm. that may not be correct because you will be still overdosing maybe the bone marrow. Okay. The fat should be subtracted from the body mass and only fat-free mass should be used. Mm -hmm. But this is still something that's being investigated. Okay, all right. And uh, next is the uh, third question is uh, related with uh, maybe a PSMA. Can these patients be scanned in PET CD or PET CD unit after therapy? And which protocol is used for scanning? Yes, yes. So you can uh, uh, look. How do we know whether beta therapy or alpha therapy has worked? Mm -hmm. uh, the only way to do it that you have to do the uh, scanning of the patients, yes. So you can do CT scanning, you can do uh, the CT scanning will show you the bulk of the disease if it's large. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to see the progression of the metastasis mm -hmm. and the spread of the disease, then you should be really using SPECT or PET CT. Okay. Yes, to, to identify the, the smaller lesions around the body. Okay. So um, as was shown in the example, it looks like that the gallium isotope is often used, but you can also use FDG PET to, to monitor the progression. All of the therapy, as well as the imaging doses throughout the patient care should be those summed up 
and put together to calculate the overall dose delivered to patient mm -hmm. through therapy and subsequent imaging mm -hmm. to, to account uh, for overall dosimetry and radiation dose to cancer as well as to healthy tissues. All right. And the ne next question is, uh, has there been long follow-up study to assess the long-term side effect of alpha particle? Look, this is still uh, very going? early to say. Mm -hmm. Reason being is that we are still with alpha particles in phase one, phase two studies. Mm -hmm. And as you would have noticed uh, in my slide, what, for example, the German group by Kratok will said, mm -hmm. they are basically selecting patients that are in the last stages of their disease. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, this is not really a tested in curative okay. setting. Mm -hmm. It is tested in palliative setting. Mm -hmm. So the long-term uh, side effects are still to be investigated. Yes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it is really uh, with the, often the patients that have for ethical purposes, when you want to run this through ethics in the hospital, mm -hmm. you really can recruit patients who have exhausted mm -hmm all other therapies before you can enroll them mm -hmm. into phase one trial for targeted alpha therapies. So I presume when the phase one, phase two trials are determined, we can maybe move the targeted alpha therapies from palliative mm -hmm. scavenging therapies to curative therapies, and then we will have data for long-term side effects. Okay. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, the, okay, mm -hmm. next is, uh, what is the dosage com convention to administrate the alpha emitter? Oh, I do not have the data here. Uh, I would have to open some files for yeah, me. It's okay, so then I... maybe they are fine there. So we are now- Yeah, read, read our paper. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, the last question is uh, from me. Uh, I was just wondering if you could describe the role of the medical physicist for target therapy at the oh, hospital. Uh, well, the role of medical physicist is very extremely important. Yeah, important. Yes. The audience is uh, uh, all yes, medical yes. physicists. Uh, it depends, depending on any stage, whether it's in research doing the cellular and animal experiments, often mm -hmm. it is the medical physicists with radiation biologists or mm -hmm. molecular biologists designing these experiments and conducting them. Mm -hmm. The role of the medical physicists is also radiation safety because you are working with uh, unsealed radioimmunoconjugates with yeah, liquid yeah, radioactive good. materials. So you have the risk of spill. They have to look after the safety of the staff, even in the research environment. Mm -hmm. There is also an issue of uh, waste management. There is also an important issue of dosimetry you know, uh, measurement of biodistribution inside the animals. In the clinical environment, starts from the very first, let's say you order, I uh, um, know that there are some private companies that are already testing actinium-2 to 5 radioimmunoconjugates in Australia. Uh, so medical physicists will receive the radioisotope sign off for, to accept the radioactive package, will have to do quality assurance of that radioisotopes to confirm the isotope and the activity. This can be done in collaboration with a radiochemist in the department. They will work with the department to develop administration and radiation safety protocols. They will observe the administration they will also ensure that there have been no spills or if there have been spills, that the spills have been managed safely 
and that the reporting of any incidents and accidents have been done. And similarly, they will be uh, calculating the dose distribution inside the patient and uh, monitoring waste management. I think we need more work also from medical yeah. physicists yeah. in terms of MERD dosimetry. Mm -hmm. Okay, now on time to finish. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm very sorry though. I cannot control the time very well. I, yes, no, we, we have many, many questions from participants, but uh, I'm going to close this session. But uh, finally, I would like to thank you again, the great to talk today. And also, I handled uh, this video to uh, G Professor Jin as a closing remark. Jean, please go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Oh, Jean, still mute. We cannot hear your voice. Jin, are you are you available? Uh, I think there is Jin, uh, your voice. We are not able to listen. Some mic problem, Jin. No. No. Ah. Uh, so 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 just let me. Okay, let me. Ah. Uh, so ah. Uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Eva Bezak, for an excellent talk and a very new topic and uh, that has shown that a lot of questions. Uh, so how interesting this topic is about the beta and alpha therapy. Uh, thanks to Hajime Monjen for excellently conducting and moderating this session. Thanks to all the participants who have participated in this uh, webinar very actively and they have put many questions and uh, this webinar recording will be available on the form uh, uh, the website within coming three days all the earlier recording are available on the form website so as and when you get time please uh, visit the website and see all this recorded webinars then uh, just before concluding, I want to just um, give a message that uh, we have lost one of the towering uh, medical physicist, John Professor John Mellard, uh, Mellard, who was the past president of the IOMP and also IUPSM. And he has hugely contributed. You can read uh, his detailed uh, the biography, which is there. Uh, he has contributed hugely in MRI and positron emission tomography, very important uh, imaging devices, hugely contributed to this thing. And he was uh, the, uh, the Secretary General of the IOMP and then the President and also President of the IUPSM. He has been awarded Fellow of the IUPSM. And to recognize his contribution, the IOMP has started John Millard the award in the IOMP. Uh, we lost him on the 25th February 2021 at the age of 94. He was a towering personality and hugely contributed. So this is obituary, which is now available on the AFOM uh, IOMP website also. And as you know, that every month we organize uh, the uh, webinars. So next webinar uh, will be in April. And we are planning uh, that all the details are available on the AFOM till the uh, June. From July to December, we are planning the webinar. Your suggestions are welcome for any topics 
or any way suggestions. Also, as you know that this is CPD accredited CME earning two points and already link is given by Jin Xians. Uh, so you can uh, give your details so you will get the certificate for these things. Uh, Jin, can you, uh, uh, is audible or you can have mic is okay? Do you want to comment something? Oh, it's fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now we can take over. You can take over. You can take over. No, no. No, you are doing... No, no. A lot of efforts has been done by the FOM team, uh, the ETC chair, Jin, uh, the PRC chair, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Chai Hong. They are doing so, wonderful. Uh, all, everybody. Uh, so, thanks to them. Yes. If you can want Thank to you. say a few words before closing, just uh, I hand over to you. Jin? Yeah, it's closing. Uh, I, 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 the, the network is not stable yet. So thanks, okay. Eva. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ajini. So thank you very much. I think we are close today. Yeah. See you next so, time. Bye-bye. Rajini is taking a lot of efforts for sending uh, the emails and the, uh, the yes, reminders yes. and things. So whole entire team is working uh, voluntarily, excellently, and uh, during this COVID time also, we have kept on the flag of uh, education flying. Uh, we want to continue this thing with all of your support. Thanks to each one of you who are directly and directly, right? And then we want to see in the next webinar into the April. With these things, I close the session. Thank you, each one of you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Monjain. Thank you, Thank you, for you. Thank you Rajni. Thank you, uh, Jin. Nice. Thank Meet you. next time. Thank you. Thank you.